Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, as I offer these words this evening, I beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, uh, Jonah had been told to go to Nineveh. This is not the first time, of course, for those of you who might remember the story of Jonah. We had a little interruption in the story. There was a little bit about Jonah not wanting to go to Nineveh because he knew what was going to happen. Remember this? He told God, I don't want to go to Nineveh because all I'm going to do is say, repent, repent, and they're going to repent, and, uh, and then you're going to forgive them because that's the kind of God you are. And so I'm going to go away with these sailors. And, of course, they realized really quickly this was not a good idea to take on passengers. Uh, and they threw him overboard. He stayed in the belly of a whale for a while. Is evidently comes out of the whale. We are not told really how that happens. Like the most interesting thing in the story. Like, how did you get out of the whale? That's what I want to know. But we don't get to know that. But what we do know is that he sends him then to Nineveh. Right? And he goes and he preaches repentance. And they repent. And God forgives. It's great. It's a great story. Thank goodness I'm not Jonah. Uh, and you're not Nineveh. All right? Like, so can we hold on to that a little bit tonight? Like, I'm not Jonah. You're not Nineveh. But I do think in some way we have to address in this season of Lent the idea of sin and evil in the world. And I think too often, Lent is a time for skirting across the issues with tiny acts of faith uh, when what is before us is quite troublesome in the world. And that you and I, in all honesty, uh, uh, come home many a time wondering what's going on in the world around. So I think we have to face up to this in some very real way. And if you'll let me, just for a few minutes tonight, I'd like to hold that space for us, okay? Just, if you'll allow me to hold it, let me talk a little bit about it. And I promise you, I promise you, the story ends well, okay? But we can't get to the story and the goodness of the story without walking faithfully like the people of Nineveh in some way. Now, uh, uh, this happens to also be a topic because the confirmands and those being received and reaffirming today are going to stand before us and reaffirm their renunciation of evil. So this is, a, this is a quite important for us to consider these things this evening in a conversation with God who is our maker and by whom we repeat quite often in our liturgies is the judge of our lives. So I think we have to speak very plainly and clearly uh, based on today. And what I, what I want to say is to give you a little hint of, at the end is to say this. It is Christ Jesus who adds coherence for us in this question of sin and evil in the world. And so we know uh, the story. <laughs> We know what happens, and we need, as we are faithfully uh, pondering these things, to hold that Christ at the center uh, uh, that brings coherence to all of this. And and part of this is to say that that for us, uh, our uh, sin, and we avoid this as Episcopalians, it's just not polite to talk about. Our sin and our participation in evil is very real. And this is the moment of pearl clenching. Oh, the bishop has said those two words. I thought I was in the Episcopal Church. Um, But in all honesty, I think that we as Episcopalians actually have a beautiful approach to the question. And so we lean in. And the thought is, if you will, that Christ does indeed offer us a meaningful and intelligible manner of doing this work, which is very deep. 
And, and what I want to begin by saying is that we, we have to take the first step by realizing that God deeply wants to be with us. God, and that's why he sends Jonah to Nineveh, isn't it? God wants to be with us. God desires our unity. God desires, out of his love for us, God desires to be with all of us. There are no separate groups in that. It's just God wants to be with people. It's very clear, and it's a clear part of the story, that God wants to be with us, and that God, the only way that we can participate with God is through our human nature, and it's the only way God can participate with us. Which means no matter who you are and how you come to be here tonight, you have brought the very basic means by which we can relate to God. We also relate to one another through our human nature. And this is the part of where sin and evil often comes in. You see, we commodify, if you will, each other. We use each other. Uh, It's kind of the nature of society, right? Each person has a role to fill. Uh, But the way we do it in the modern world, and it doesn't matter really what economy we look at, we make people invisible to us so that we diminish human nature. We diminish human giftedness. We diminish the ability to see who actually provides our food. Who drives it across the country? Who stays on the ship so that we can have bananas in the winter? You see what I'm saying? That that we don't ever go deep enough to realize the massive amount of connectivity we have in our society through our economy and the way we treat one another. For everything seems to magically appear for us. When we leave a restaurant, our table is magically cleared for us by unnamed people. We commodify one another. It's just the reality we live in. But for Christians, we have to face that and recognize that that way of looking actually fulfills three different forms of ancient religious sacrifice. And you're going, whoa, okay, there was a turn. (laughs) Right? But think about it for a moment. So the original Holocaust offering. Okay, I'm not talking about what happened in Germany or any of the Holocausts that have happened all over the world throughout time. Uh, I am talking about the offerings of religions for, for time of memorial. And a Holocaust is the complete burning up, the using of the sacrificial animal. It is uh, to place it on the fire that God, the gods regardless of what god you were worshiping, the gods would consume it, right? So it is consumed, and it is no more. The second one is a cereal offering, which is where uh, fruits, first fruits, you've heard of first fruits, first, the first fruits might be brought. Uh, or uh, in the Cain and Abel story, right, they get a little jealous about who's got the best first fruits, right? but that there's some first fruits that are brought. And in those sacrificial offerings, regardless of your religious background, those sacrificial, typically the priest consumes what is left of the offering. It's a way of providing for the priestly ministry. In this way, we may begin to imagine just as if people were become invisible in our commodification of them, we also consume their offerings of goods that are brought to us. And then finally, there is the scapegoat. And the scapegoat, right, is the person uh, who we excuse with all of our trouble. So whether it's family, we got lots of scapegoats, people. (laughs) Family, friends, right, cliques, uh, the, the ones we pick on in our offices or at our school, right? We have scapegoats, and they... Uh, We we oppress them by making them take on all of our anxiety and fear. In other words, we use the scapegoat, not unlike the other offerings, to restore order or seemingly to restore order. 
What I'm offering to you is simply that I think in, in Lent, we begin to understand that unrest in the rest of the world is aptly, actually deeply connected to every one of us in this room. Migration connected to everyone in this room. The death of mothers connected <laughs> because they can't get maternal health care connected to us. Because of the way we live. It is our nature. (laughs) Now I offer you this to understand one thing very, that's very important. And that is that we're all sinful. (laughs) We are not, we are not above the sin that is in us. And, as the scripture says, as doctors, we cannot heal ourselves. And so we ask, What is the one sacrifice that we are to be attentive to in this moment, in this Lent, that helps us to understand that death and sacrifice, commodification, and invisibility will not have the last word in this society or any society? What is the one sacrifice that will take care of all that? And it is God's willingness and desire to be with us that he comes and is incarnated to share our human nature, to become one of us, yet without sin, to show us a different way of living, but most important, most importantly, to die upon a cross as the sacrifice that will end all sacrifices. It doesn't mean that we don't live with horror in this world. It doesn't mean that we don't live with sin in this world. It just means that will not have the last word. Power and principalities, Paul says in Romans, will not have the last word. It will not separate you from the love of God because Christ Jesus has already taken care of all of that for you. Now, Leslie Newbigin was quick to warn at this point That it is a terrible misunderstanding to think that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that we are relieved from the woes of the world. So what we must do is to understand in Lent, I think, that it's time for us to take steps whereby our wants our desires, our needs, our selfishness become the martyrs in this society rather than the people and our neighbors and strangers who we don't even know. And to figure out how we might reform and change our way of living with real choices that will, in the end, bring around our responsibility for the world in which we live. Dust to dust and ashes to ashes (laughs) no longer has power over us. But we are given an opportunity to sacrifice ourselves on behalf of the good because Jesus Christ has made the supreme sacrifice for all of us. We are free for the first time to not require those sacrifices of others. So as we stand, and don't just renounce, but repudiate evil in this world, and say we will stand for the good, we must always know that there is one who stands in front of us, arms out wide, embracing all who are troubled and heavy laden and come down. God's love is the end of the story and the best part. But you and I have to go to Nineveh and Lent in order to get right with the God who loves us out of gratitude and thanksgiving for a sacrifice we could not have made on our own as human beings. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.